Good afternoon and welcome to the Cato Institute. My name is David Bowes. I'm Executive Vice President of the Institute. If there are people out there in the hallway, please know that there are seats uh, down front and in the back, and especially along the walls. You just have to uh, step, apart, step across some people. Um, we're going to have a very interesting discussion today. I'm going to make just a few remarks to get us started, and then I will introduce each of our speakers um, as they are, are ready to speak. It seems to me that for the past 70 years or so, conservatives, at least in the United States, have opposed the demands for liberation and equal rights by Jews, blacks, women, and gay people. And now Republicans wonder why they don't get many votes from those groups. <laughs> the good news is that once each struggle for civil rights has been clearly won, conservatives accept it and insist that, in fact, they never opposed it. <laughs> After a generation of insisting that a mother's place is in the home, conservatives spent 2008 declaring that the right place for a mother of five, one of them pregnant and one a newborn with special needs, is next door to the Oval Office. <laughs> but the civil rights struggle of our own time is that of gay and lesbian people, and conservatives are still performing their traditional role of opposing it. Is that going to change? Will it change once gay people have achieved all the legal rights that other groups have in their civil rights efforts? In this case, at least, it seems that British conservatives are ahead of Americans, or, to be fair, are at least in a different place. Our speaker today is not even the first openly gay member of a conservative shadow cabinet, yet we can hardly imagine a John McCain cabinet having an openly gay member. There's not even an openly gay Republican member of Congress. I'm not even sure there's an openly gay person employed in the entire conservative movement. So while conservatives have embraced the equal rights and equal dignity of Jews, African Americans, and women, they have not yet reached that point with gay people. Let me uh, move on now to introduce our first speaker. Nick Herbert is Shadow Secretary of State for Environment, Food, and, Ru and Rural Affairs in David Cameron's Shadow Cabinet. He's been a member of Parliament since 2005. Before entering Parliament, he led the successful campaign to keep Britain out of the Euro, which is probably looking like a better and better decision these days. <laughs> and he was co-founder and director of the think tank Reform. Please welcome Nick Herbert. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I'm delighted to be here at Cato, the guardian of true liberalism. Thank you for hosting this event. And I'm especially honored to be sharing a platform with one of Britain's most valuable exports, Andrew Sullivan. On the way over, I read Andrew's book, Virtually Normal. He ends by calling for a new politics with a simple principle that all public discrimination against homosexuals should end and every right and responsibility enjoyed by heterosexuals should be extended. But I also read Hernshaw's Conservatism in England, written before my father was born in 1932. He concludes, to conservatives above all others falls the task of defending the menaced citadel of civilization and maintaining the eternal sanctity of the moral law. Professor Hernshaw's misguided revolutionaries were not gay rights activists, but his clarion call for a faith-based conservatism finds many supporters today. So can promoting equality for gay people be compatible with conservatism? In discussing this, I'm going to take three things as given, and if they're contentious, they shouldn't be. First, since on most conservative estimates, around 5% of the population are attracted to the same sex, there are more than 3 million people in the UK who are gay and 15 million in the United States. P. 
People often speak of gays as though we are a society apart from the rest, living in our own quarter. And a few choose to be apart, but most of us don't. We live in every city and town. We are businessmen and women. We run shops and stack shelves. We labor on farms and in factories. We are firefighters and police officers. We save lives in hospitals. We fight for our countries, and sometimes we die for our countries. Some of us are extraordinary, but mostly we are quietly ordinary. We are not different, and we don't want to be different. We're not asking for special treatment. We are United States or British citizens, proud of our countries, wanting to play a part in our society. And across the world, there are millions of us, millions of ordinary people, millions of voters. Second, we can't be uninvented. Being gay is not a lifestyle choice. Our sexuality is a fact. It may be repressed, but it cannot be changed. Doctors don't try to change a person's color, and healers or politicians shouldn't try to change anyone's sexuality. Whether it is given by God or set by nature, homosexuality isn't nurtured by doting mothers or weak fathers. It isn't a condition to be cured, and it can't be willed away through prayer. Third, democracies should subscribe to a fundamental principle that all men are created equal. Some claim that the promotion of gay equality has no place in conservatism. In fact, many deny that conservatives should be interested in the equality agenda at all. It is argued that equality is incompatible with liberty, that if men are free, they are bound to become unequal. But conservatives who want people to become better through their own efforts can never stand by while others are denied that chance. Conservatives should always believe that everyone should have an equal chance in life, regardless of any other factors, and that they should not be discriminated against. As Robert Levy, the chairman of this institute, has recently written, and I quote, Thomas Jefferson set the stage in the De Declaration of Independence. To secure these rights, governments are instituted among men. The primary purpose of government is to safeguard individual rights and prevent some persons from harming others. Heterosexuals should not be treated preferentially when the state carries out that role, and no one is harmed by the union of two consenting gay people." End quote. Today, I want to explain why I believe that conservatism is not only entirely compatible with the principle of equality between gay and straight people, but that such equality is in fact an essential element of modern conservatism. I want to explain how my party leader, David Cameron, has reshaped the Conservative Party in the United Kingdom. How we have developed a progressive conservative agenda to secure important social objectives through conservative means. How we have made a commitment to the vital institution of marriage, a central part of our program and how we believe that this institution is strengthened, not weakened, by extending its ambit to same-sex relationships. I'm not here to preach or to interfere in your affairs. I am neither here to tea party nor to go clubbing. <laughs> but I can tell you what happens to a party when it closes the door to sections of our society and is reduced to its core vote. It's no fun being in opposition for 13 years. And I can tell you what happens when a party opens its doors again and broadens its appeal. A successful political party should be open to all and ought to look something like the country it seeks to govern. In recent history, the Conservative Party in Parliament in the UK reflected only a section of our society, male, white, professional, gay suit, grey suited and straight. <laughs> At the last election, of our 193 MPs elected, just 17 were women, only one black and two were openly gay. If we were truly representative of the country, we would have 99 women, 16 black or minority ethnic, and 10 gay members of parliament. So our party leadership recognized the need to change, 
Change because we're a national party which needs to be able to speak to and speak up for all sections of society in all parts of the country. As David Cameron said on Monday, unless you can represent everyone in our country, you cannot be a one nation party. Change because we need to reconnect politics with a public who are increasingly disillusioned with a political class. And change because it was the right thing to do to promote an environment where people can succeed and live without fear, regardless of their gender, color, or sexuality. We now have more female candidates, more black and minority ethnic candidates, and more gay candidates fighting at the next election. In fact, if we secure a majority in the House of Commons of just one seat at the election which will be held in the United Kingdom within 100 days, we are likely to have more openly gay MPs on our benches than the Labour Party. The Conservative Party leadership was not alone in recognizing the need to change. Gay candidates have been selected by local party members, not imposed by the leadership. I, an openly gay man, was selected before the last election by my local party, voted for by grassroots conservatives, and I've been promoted on merit. I'm one of two Conservative MPs who have taken out a civil partnership, thanks to legislation which, to their credit, the current Labour government introduced, but which the Conservative Party supported. I led our party's support for a new law to prevent the incitement of hatred against gay people, subject to our concern that temperate comment should never be criminalised. And our party leader, David Cameron, has publicly apologised for Section 28, legislation introduced by a previous Conservative government which effectively prohibited the teaching of the validity of gay relationships in schools, a law which was deeply unpopular, not just amongst gay people, but with those who saw it as a divisive and unpleasant sign of state intolerance. We needed to say sorry for a stance that was wrong, and we showed that as a party we were willing to admit mistakes and set a new course and I believe we are stronger for that. In his first speech to the Conservative Conference as leader of the party, a major event which brings together party activists from across the country, David Cameron said something extraordinary. <laughs> Defying the critics who claimed that party leaders could no longer express a moral preference for the institution, he spoke of the importance of commitment and marriage as the bedrock of our society. But then he added, and by the way, it means something whether you're a man and a woman, a woman and a woman, or a man and another man. And when he said these words, the delegates applauded, not a half-hearted ripple of applause, but a spontaneous burst of approbation. And at that moment, we knew that the Conservative Party and British politics had changed. David Cameron has put marriage at the centre of our prospectus for the next election, arguing that society is broken, that, that we need to recognize the importance of marriage in providing a stable environment in which to raise children. But in supporting marriage, he has not done so in such a way as to denigrate or even exclude gay people. In fact, the opposite, because we've recognized that commitment and stability are important in all relationships. I appreciate the view held by some on a strict reading of their faith, that marriage is a unique arrangement which is only available to a man and a woman. And we should never dictate to religious organizations who are doing no harm that they should, in their own rights or places of worship, depart from their sincerely held beliefs. But in the UK, we created in law a civil union for heterosexual couples, specifically devoid of any religious ceremony and and significance for those who do not wish to marry in church. So what religious grounds could there be for opposing the extension of a secular institution to gay couples through the introduction of civil partnerships in 2005? And why stand against the extension of a civil institution which demands a public declaration of commitment and stability? Those who argue against legal recognition for gay partnerships often claim that many gay people have promiscuous lifestyles. But there are few social incentives of the kind which conservatives should naturally embrace for gay people to embrace commitment. There's little social support 
no institutions to encourage fidelity or monogamy, and precious little religious or moral outreach to guide gay people into what may be seen as more virtuous living. So it's right to recognize commitment in gay partnerships. In the same way, we should reject discrimination against gay couples who wish to adopt. I believe that the best parental arrangements are represented by a good father and a good mother, and children should never be treated as some kind of high value consumer good. But this ideal of a loving and present father and mother together is often not realized. So we should not seek to prevent <coughs> adoption by same-sex couples who may offer a love and stability that is absent from too many homes. We should not say that whatever their talents, despite the contributions they can make, there are things that people may not do simply because of their sexuality. In the UK, we've allowed gays to serve openly in our military for 10 years. No one, no one can credibly claim that our troops' effectiveness serving alongside US forces in Afghanistan has been compromised by this policy. To bar people from making the most profound commitment to their nation or to ask them to live their lives dishonestly by not telling is something no conservative should support. As Israel, hardly a country which goes in for soft defense has understood, and in the words of Barry Goldwater, you don't have to be straight to be in the military, you just have to be able to shoot straight. <laughs> I don't believe that conservatism should be a closed membership club. We must be open to everyone because we believe that everyone should have a chance. Conservatism at its most powerful has been, always been, a uniting creed. We're conservative because we believe in strong defense and the nation state. We're conservative because we believe in responsibility and justice. We're conservative because we want to strengthen society and limit government. We're conservative because we're skeptical about big government and have faith in our institutions and families. Since Disraeli spoke of one nation, we have always understood the importance of maintaining a strong society, and we have never confused that goal with faith in big government or state action. The progressive conservatism which David Cameron has espoused is in the true one nation tradition. It's about using radical conservative philosophy, politics and policy to serve truly progressive goals. It's about fostering local democracy, engagement and accountability by returning power to town halls, neighborhoods and individuals. It's about pursuing a family agenda that lets parents take responsibility for their children's education, allowing them to set up their own schools so that we can give everyone a fair chance in life. It's about developing bold approaches to tackling poverty and inequality in all its forms, engaging more actively with a voluntary sector and encouraging a revolution in social responsibility. And it's about recognizing that there is such a thing as society, it's not just the same thing as the state. If we stand against equality of opportunity, which should be an article of faith for the right, it becomes the preserve of the left, warped into an agenda of state interference, targets, and central control, when it should be about getting out of people's way and letting them advance. In the UK, all three major political parties are now assuring gay people that it's safe to vote for them. Typically, far from taking pleasure in this new consensus, the left has greeted it with dismay. For over a decade, they've sought to build a client state where groups are beholden to their generosity. And now they want to open up clear pink water between themselves and the Conservative Party. There's an election coming, and it suits our opponents to argue that we haven't changed. But we self-evidently have changed. I suppose, in a small way, my presence here is evidence of that. The truth is that there are millions of people who we drove away, but who share our values and want to join us. Gay people are not the property of the left, nor of any party. They are not an interest group or a political commodity to be traded. They are not vessels for votes. Gay people are motivated by the same issues as any other voter. They'll vote for the political party which best sits with their views, so long 
as that party doesn't make itself taboo. For the modern Conservative Party, embracing gay equality is neither a temporary phenomenon nor an agenda which can be reversed. We know that we've got further to go to modernise our party. And if we form the next government, we intend to entrench the progress made on gay equality and to move the agenda forward. If there's a need for new laws, we'll consider them. But we will also understand where we should give a lead and where there is a need for a law. Conservatives should never leap to legislate. So we will show leadership in demanding action to tackle homophobic abuse in sport, where behaviour and role models can exert such a powerful influence on young people, just as we should demand action against all abusive behaviour on the playing fields. We will take the strongest stand against the homophobic bullying of children in schools, as we should take a stand against all bullying, and we will not allow our support for faith schools to undermine that stand. We will insist on action against hate crime where gay people are the victims, as we should insist on action against all hate crimes which incite fear and violence. We will speak out when countries abuse the human rights of gay people, as we should speak out when any human rights are abused. None of these areas necessarily require new laws, but they do require a clear-sighted and determined conviction about the importance of political leadership in promoting human dignity and equality. When I was born in 1963, homosexual conduct was a crime. I and millions of others are free to be who we are now because of the courage of political leaders who saw that this prohibition was wrong. I and thousands of others are free to enter into a civil partnership now because of the courage of politicians who saw that to exclude us from making that commitment was wrong. And the need for this leadership has not gone away. So let us be clear about the kind of society we want to build. One where a child can go to school without being bullied because of his or her sexuality. Where people can be honest with their friends and families and employers and not live a lie. Where the terraces at football games don't ring with homophobic abuse. Where a public de declaration of lifelong commitment to another person can be made by anyone where communities are safe and no one is fearful because of who they are, where anyone can serve their country without being asked who it is they love, where no one is held back and opportunity is available to all, and where the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom or the President of the United States could just as easily be gay as black. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. It's rather gutsy of a Brit to make a Tea Party joke in the United <laughs> States. But the, uh, the oppressive government we worry about today is the one on this side of the Atlantic. <clears throat> um, our second speaker today, Andrew Sullivan, is best known as one of the first and one of the most controversial political bloggers. Uh, judging by the reactions I got when I sent out the invitation to this meeting, controversial seems to be putting it mildly. Um, of course, before the blogging, he was the editor of the New Republic, where he won three National Magazine Awards and one Editor of the Year Award. He holds a PhD from Harvard, and his books include Virtually Normal, An Argument About Homosexuality, and The Conservative Soul, How We Lost It, How to Get It Back. Please welcome Andrew Sullivan. Thank you very much, David, and thank you, Cato, for making this possible. To be quite honest, I'm my breath is still taken away by Nick's speech. I'm sure that many of you are also somewhat reeling from it. It feels like water in a desert. It feels like the truth. And for those of us who have been gay and also understand ourselves in favor of all the things that Nick has said, individual responsibility, individual freedom, limited government, the family, 
personal responsibility, who have been cast out as openly gay people from the conservative movement and demonized by the Republican Party, hear these words from a conservative leader and feel a great emotion because the struggle in this country has been extremely difficult and emotional and tough on all of us. In some ways, it is so ironic that in America, gay conservatism was ahead of Britain a long time ago. The arguments, the conservative arguments for gay marriage, the conservative arguments for the ability of patriotic Americans to serve their country without being persecuted or outed or demonized by their own government was actually innovated in the United States before the United Kingdom. In the 1990s, those of us who were openly gay and conservative faced unbelievable hostility from the gay left. We were targeted. My book, Virtually Normal, was picketed by gay groups as I um, took it around the country. There was a group called the Lesbian Avengers who had my face in crosshairs on a placard in front of a bookstore in Chicago. Many people in this room remember those days. We were called homocons by the gay left. We were smeared. But we stood up and defended ourselves because we believed in the principles that we still believe in. And those principles are actually slightly to the right of you, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm actually more of a Thatcherite than a One Nation Tory. I actually disagree with all hate crimes legislation. In Virtually Normal, I even opposed employment anti-discrimination laws. I've since changed my mind on that, simply because the abstract theoretical argument I was making has been rendered moot, I think, by the simple facts of our politics. But I remain an implacable foe of hate crimes laws. And I also remain, because I am a conservative, in favor of marriage rights rather than civil partnerships, because I believe the family is important, and because I believe the gay people are members, integral members of our own families, and we deserve not to be cast out of them or segregated from them as we grow older. I also believe as Nick has said, that it is simply a fact, a fact that there is no necessary connection between the person and the gender to whom one is emotionally and se sexually attracted and one's political viewpoint. I do not see a connection between being gay and whether you're in favor of the Iraq war. I simply do not see a connection between being gay and whether you believe in a carbon tax rather than cap and trade. I simply see no connection between sexual orientation and a view of the state that is limited and a view of the state that is socialistic. I became a conservative because I grew up in a socialist country, one in which I saw socialism destroy and undermine the spirit of enterprise, of confidence, of growth, and of equality of opportunity under the awful stultifying embrace of equality of outcome. I was, in 1981, a proud member in my own high school of wearing a Reagan 80 button, which was not very popular at the time. <laughs> my record as a conservative, even though I am now called a left liberal by the Republican Party, is absolutely solid. I'm also, of course, a Tory Oakshottian more than a American Straussian. <laughs> Are those the options? They, <laughs> at some very deep level, yes. <laughs> Both very deep and very high. Especially with the Oakshottians. <laughs> I haven't changed. I know that many of my fellow gay conservatives and libertarians haven't changed. 
Um, I know that we can occasionally differ on the general choices between us, and I've always been a Tory, not a Republican, which means that I think that, for example, it's perfectly possible to support a Democratic president from time to time if one believes that he genuinely represents a more conservative, traditionally conservative position than the radical Republicanism that we have seen grown in this country. So why have we come this far? Why is this such a bitter, angry, hateful, brutalizing debate? Why have we been subjected and are being subjected by the base of the Republican Party to the most base obloquy? Why, when an openly gay Republican, Jim Colby, stood up at a Republican convention, did an entire delegation turn around and face the other way? Why have we been subjected by Karl Rove and other manipulators to clearly homophobic campaigns designed to play on fear, designed to actually exploit some of the worst things in human nature? deciding that a minority of people who are two or three percent of the country, I think fewer than Nick does, see I am to the right of Nick in some ways, <laughs> somehow represent a threat to the 97 percent to such an extent that they were prepared and the President of the United States did endorse an amendment to the Constitution of the United States to permanently enshrine gay people as second-class citizens. It has not simply been that the Republican Party has stayed still while the Tory party has moved forward. It is that the Republican Party has lent and moved and aggressively accelerated a direction against gay people. There were once openly gay members of Congress who were Republicans. There are none anymore. The campaigns that are being run out there and have been used are viciously homophobic. The, uh, the campaign by, by Rubio now in Florida against Charlie Crist is about the most disgustingly homophobic I've seen in my life. The reason for this is quite simple, and it's what I've tried to explain in my book, The Conservative Soul. The Republican Party is no longer a political party. It is a religious organization whose fundamental beliefs are in religious authority, fundamentalist truth, and obedience to a supreme and important leader called the President, who has uncontrolled power within our Constitution. I want to finish by simply saying this, and reiterating what Nick has said. Gay people in this country, despite all of this, despite an atmosphere in which we were abused, despite an atmosphere in which Karl Rove, when challenged about why he was doing this, simply said, it's about the numbers. There are more of them than of you. It's about a Republican Party whose soul has been corrupted by power and by a false understanding of what religious faith is about. And when I see how gay people have served their country have lost life and limb, are today out there in Afghanistan and Iraq and around the world fighting for us and our freedoms, only to be treated as subhuman by their own governments, even to be treated to the kind of rhetoric we saw in the Senate only recently. It saddens and grieves me as it should any decent person. I also want to say that the arguments that I've made and made now for 20 years in favor of marriage equality were not ever, 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 ever meant to be in any way an attack upon the family. I cherish the family. I love the family. I love the heterosexual family. I revere heterosexual marriage like so many other gay people. And when my own family and my husband's family came together and our mothers took us up the aisle together 
and our nieces and nephews, flower girls and ring bearers, were able to unite two families and celebrate our commitment to one another for the rest of our lives, and we mean it. It was a profoundly integrating, beautiful, moving, and indescribable experience. To have grown up as a kid, and the first thing you know when you realize you're gay, and the first thing people used to know in my generation was that you would never be able to have what your parents had. There was something so deeply wrong with you that you couldn't even be a part of your own family. That your brothers and sisters looked forward to that special day. The most important day of your life, they told us. That's what I was brought up to believe, because love is more important than career and money. That when we were told as kids, and we figured out we were gay, and we knew that that could never happen to us, for nothing we had ever done, the psychic wound and pain that it inflicts, and still inflicts every day on young children, distorts the psyche, warps the soul, destroys the spirit. And in that moment, when we got married, I have never been prouder of my two families, my mother-in-law and father-in-law from Michigan. My mother-in-law worked for 30 years as a school bus driver in Michigan. Al-Qaeda could not defeat her in a second. <laughs> she brought a caravan of goods and food to support us. My own mother, the devoutest of Catholics, I brought up loving, deeply loving my church and believing in my faith and trusting the hierarchy of my church and serving as an altar boy and reading theology. As a Catholic in England, where it wasn't that easy to stand up for one's own faith in a culture, to have that institution also wage a cruel and really abusive war on gay people was also something that it is hard to describe. But we have withstood it. In this country, those of us who proudly call ourselves gay conservatives have struggled against the gay left. And now we are struggling against the far Republican right, which is now the Republican Party. But in that moment, when we got married, none of that mattered. Because after all of this, after all of politics, we're human beings and our love endures and our marriages are real, regardless of law, regardless of politics. And that is in the end what keeps us going. Because we know we're right and we know that God loves us and we know that as conservatives we have fought the good fight against forces other people don't begin to understand. Thank you very much, Andrew. And now for something completely different. <laughs> Our final speaker tonight, today, um, Maggie Gallagher is president of the National Organization for Marriage and of the Institute for Marriage and Public Policy. Maggie is a nationally syndicated columnist, the author of three books on marriage, including most recently with University of Chicago professor Linda Waite, The Case for Marriage, Why Married People Are Happier, Healthier, and Better Off Financially, and one of the most prominent voices in opposition to same-sex marriage. Please welcome Maggie Gallagher. Well, thank you. I, I should say off the start that I didn't come here to debate same-sex marriage. I'll issue an open invitation to come back if that would be. Uh, I, I do appreciate being asked to be part of this conversation. And I thought kind of hard about where, given where the Cato Institute is and where I am on the American political landscape, how I could make a contribution to this conversation. 
I do want to say, Nick, uh, first of all, thank you for coming all this way in the middle of an election season. Um, I do know openly gay people who've worked for my organization. Uh, I'm not going to out them here because I think it may make it hard for them to get a date, but I do believe, <laughs> I do understand. The weird thing you know from my position is that gay people are not a monolithic block, not even on gay marriage, that there are gay people who believe many different things. And those who want to come and work with me to protect marriage as a union of husband and wife are welcome. Um, I also feel like I should apologize. I do think this is the, the question on the table is, is there a place for gay people in the American conservative movement? And I feel strange that I'm here at Cato kind of representing American conservatism in, in some sense with a, a, a British conservative. And um, I don't want to say that, uh, I accept that Andrew is a conservative, but he's the very small contingent of pro-Obama conservatives at this point, right? So. Uh, I know that uh, I'm not the best person, really, to speak to the broader question of the American conservative movement before a Cato audience, except that, like Andrew, I'm actually a pre-Reagan conservative. We're the, probably the youngest people uh, in America who can say that. And when I joined the conservative movement, I was a libertarian, and I believed that joining, becoming a conservative meant that you would likely never have any influence in major institutions in American politics. So not only the strange ride of gay marriage, but Andrew probably also shares with me that sense that there is something called a conservative movement. It is important in American politics and in other ways is an extraordinary achievement of American politics. I don't know of many people, here's the problem, I don't know of many American conservatives who look at Great Britain and say, we wish American politics were generally more like that. Right? I mean, I don't, with all due respect, I, I'm not here to say what a British conservative should believe. But it seems to me um, that America remains a unique place for the protection of liberty for classical liberalism, which I share, and that the disputes we are having over gay marriage in particular are disputes within a family that we need to have. Okay? It's very hard to make the argument here that Nick did that for political reasons we need to do this, and you'll notice that Andrew didn't make that argument. Um, if a political party should look like the country, somewhere between 55 to 60 percent of Americans, even as they support gay rights, think this marriage thing is something else. Gay marriage is not right. The most recent Gallup poll, if you ask Americans whether gay marriage would be good for the country or hurt the country, 48 percent say it will make the country worse off, 13 percent say it will make America better off. So if we're going to have an argument about incorporating gay marriage into the heart of American conservatism, it simply can't be about how it's politically necessary. That, I mean, I, I, I don't know how many of you would disagree with me. Maybe down the road, maybe after the Supreme Court rules. Um, you know, when I first looked at this question, which I did not treat as a question about gay marriage, I, I mean, I had a problem understanding what the question is because, it, you know, having been in the conservative movement back when we never thought we'd ever have any power or influence and we couldn't take any respectable job, um, I'm highly aware that there have always been gay conservatives. There's always been gay people in the conservative movement. A political movement is not a church. It's not about purity where we all believe all the same things. It's a coalition of people who believe that they can achieve more good for the country working together than, as some people decide in the end, that their core values cause them to break with this big loose coalition. So the question, the underlying question seems to be, do we read social conservatism out of the conservative movement? Or, to put it in a more positive frame, how do we reconcile a movement for gay rights with the large chunk of traditional social conservatives that are part of the movement, of the conservative movement? I don't think that Nick's solution is going to work in America in any foreseeable future. I mean, I, don't, I think it asks of social conservatives that they cease to exist and cease to be who they are. If there is a way for us to stay together, you know, it's going to have to be, uh, uh, it's going to have to be a new and I think uniquely American development. Andrew perceives, and I know a lot of people, probably a lot of them in this room, perceive the problem as the incredible aggression on the part of the Republican Party on gay issues. I translated in that in my head. I mean, what has happened in just a few years in my lifetime is that the idea that to make a marriage you need a husband and wife is now experienced by many gay rights people, gay people, 
as angry, hateful, and aggressive. We don't experience it that way, right? We, this is the way it's always been. We believe it's important. We're out there using the democratic process, our core civil rights, to fight for something we think is true. And it saddens me, I accept it, that people now hear this, this language in itself. If I, I went on the radio in Maine and I said, marriage, unions of husbands and wife really are special. They deserve their unique status because these are the only kinds of unions that can make new life and connect those children in love to their mother and father. And the radio announcer, who I don't think was gay, I think he was a white liberal, t turned to me and said, I can't believe I'm hearing such bigotry. So I accept now that we live in a divided America where words that would once be thought not angry or hateful or aggressive, but kind of beautiful even if you disagree, are heard by an increasing number of Americans as angry, divisive, and aggressive, and denouncing of gays. I don't know what to do about it except to name the problem in the hopes that maybe being Americans we can work out something different. I think, Nick also asked a key question. Let me just tell you where I think the deep conflicts between gay rights and American conservatism lie. He asked the question, can promoting equality for gay people be compatible with conservatism? I think the answer, if that is the question, the answer is it's very difficult. The problem from my point of view, and I do think it would, it's an intellectual contribution that people who disagree with me can wrestle with, is that if gay rights are understood as liberty interests and rights, they are extremely compatible with American conservatism. But equality rights uh, and arguments lead to the expansion of government power to repress and stigmatize and marginalize those who advocate for and institutionalize around ideas that are contrary to basic democratic norms of equality. Hence, Nick is saying that the government should be involved in the schools, in the sports arenas, in faith schools, did you hear that? As well as in the family, and I don't know if he would promote that, but in Quebec, they're now arguing that anti-homophobia uh, should be used in every, to, the government should be combating homophobia, not just violence or bullying or harassment, but objections to homosexuality in every institution in society. It is very hard to make that compatible with the vision of American conservatism. We are in a city right now where our churches, Catholic Charities, has just announced that it must get out of the foster care and adoption business. It's not about whether gay people can adopt, they can adopt here. It's about whether you can run one Christian adoption agency, right, that will not do gay adoptions because it's contrary to their vision of the best thing for children. And the answer in the DC City Council when the church asked for religious liberty exemptions was no, this would be accommodating and tolerating and promoting bigotry and we're not gonna do it. There will be gay conservatives like Andrew who say, well, I don't really support that. But because the heart of the movement towards e equality drives in this direction, you know, we're gonna have to really work very hard. A lot of, I work very directly on the gay marriage movement and I will tell you, it's not scaremongering. People are scared, okay? I know that it's very hard for gay people given the, what you've experienced in America and I always I told Jonathan Rausch, our people are wussies, right? I get it. But people are waking up in an America where suddenly their deepest core moral convictions they're being told are the moral and should be the legal equivalent of racism. It's pretty striking and people are pretty scared. Whether we can move beyond that situation and f I actually believe we can because I do think America is different. But it's going, we're gonna have to decide that we wanna do it. I mean, both sides are gonna have to decide that we want an America where gay rights are about liberty and not an America where gay rights are used as a club to move through institutions to repress moral disagreement, civilly expressed, okay? Because otherwise we're creating an America where to, you cannot be a good Christian in the traditional sense and a good citizen. That's a very hard place for a country where you know, 85% of Americans are Christian and about 40, 45% show up in church. Um, Great Britain is not a model for me in this because I'll tell you what you probably don't hear about. This is again has to do with information networks. I hear about the Catholic principal of a school in Great Britain who was told he could not fire a principal who entered a gay civil union. 
And what they said in Great Britain is we believe in religious liberty. We have religious liberty. If you were, if you were the religion teacher, he could be fired. But being the principal of Catholic school has nothing to do with representing the Catholic faith or doctrine. You probably don't know about the Anglican bishop who was fined 100,000 pounds because he refused to hire an openly, actively, proudly gay youth minister in his diocese, right? The sky didn't fall, the government does that, right? You probably don't know about the Canadian charity. <clears throat> it's an evangelical charity. They run developmental home, homes for developmentally disabled adults. Evangelicals, I mean, I'm Roman Catholic, they're, they're different, okay? So they, their vision of who counts as an evangelical, who they want to hire, includes a very long morals clause. And you're not supposed to drink, you're not supposed to use pornography, you, you, no, no sex at all, except within the context of a heterosexual marriage, an opposite sex marriage. And uh, the government of Canada stepped in and uh, one, of, one of their employees decided that she preferred to be in a civil union with a, or a mayor, I'm not, she had a partner who was a woman and she was let go and she sued. And the Canadian government not only said that she has to be rehired, but this is the touch, the, the sort of the Orwellian touch, that the Christian organization must submit a re-education plan for all of its employees, you know, explaining what, what bigotry is in the Canadian context. So um, I appreciate where Andrew is coming from. And I'm here today only in the hopes that some sort of honest revelation of not only our hopes, but our fears and our concerns in some way that I cannot see right now can lead down the road to a better place than the place that Great Britain is headed. Thank you. Thank you, Maggie. All right, we're gonna open this up to uh, questions and discussion now. Uh, we will uh, ask you to raise your hand and we will bring microphones around. I am going to take the moderator's prerogative to ask the first question because it was posed to me a couple dozen times this week, and that's a question for Andrew. Andrew, the last time you were at this podium, I think, you were discussing your book on conservatism, and I asked you then if you weren't really more of a classical liberal than a conservative. And listening to your moving and eloquent speech today, um, I might still raise that question, but can you be either a conservative or a classical liberal and support not just President Obama, but his vast number of expansions of government? Uh, that's an utterly irrelevant question to this conversation, and I won't answer it. I'm happy to answer it at some other level, but it's so utterly unrelated to the subject we're talking about that I think it's a preposterous question. I mean, I'm very happy to debate why I think Obama is actually on many central issues um, uh, better than the alternative. Um, but I'm not here, here today <laughs> to talk about my philosophy about conservatism or the fusionism between classical liberalism and conservatism or what Oakeshott would understand as the position of a trimmer in a good sense, in the Halifax sense of conservatism. So I, I regard that question as absolutely preposterous and irrelevant. <laughs> all right, well, I can, I'll tell all the people who ask it. Uh, all right, well, they're happy to email me and I will answer them in, in detail. Right there. Hi, I'm Rachel Venezia, an intern at the Cato Institute. And I was wondering about, particularly about Herbert's comment about adoption. He said, let's see, I believe that the best parental arrangements are represented by a good father and a good mother, and children should never be treated as some kind of high value consumer good. But this ideal of a loving and present father and mother is often not realized. So we should not seek to prevent adoption by same sex couples. And I was wondering, this seems to imply to me that you think that the state should first try to seek a loving mother and father, and then if none can be found, then they should resort to allowing same-sex couples to adopt. And I was wondering if this is what you were trying to say. Um, I'm also interested in Mrs. Gallagher's response to this, as well as Mr. Sullivan's. Also, I was wondering, particularly um, with Mrs. Well, Mrs. one question at a time. Sorry. Okay. 
One question regarding per foster person. foster yeah. children being adopted by homosexuals. Yeah, no, I wasn't trying to um, suggest that um, gay couples who want to adopt should kind of take their place in a line behind heterosexual couples. The truth is that uh, there, there is, um, you know, a huge shortage of people who want to uh, adopt. And uh, I don't think that we should, you know, deny the opportunity uh, of children to be brought up in a stable environment. And I believe that that stable and loving environment can be represented by uh, a, a gay couple. Uh, but I also wanted to be kind of honest about what, what I think actually ultimately are the best arrangements for a child, which is, which is that they should be uh, brought up by a loving mother and a loving father. I, th I happen personally to think that that, that is uh, ideally the best uh, uh, arrangement. Um, that's a kind of uh, an indication perhaps of an element of social conservatism uh, in my view. But I, in believing that, don't think that it's proper to stand in the way of a, a gay couple who may well uh, offer just as good uh, an upbringing for, for children and that love and stability and the real problem we have in our society back in the UK is of broken homes, uh, it is of children who grow up without love and without stability and, and we should be focused on that. Anybody else want to? Okay, take another question. Yes, right here. George Mason University. Uh, this is a question for Nick, but others may want to comment on it. You state that we are not asking for special treatment. Could you say more about, therefore, your view on hate crimes legislation, which gives a different penalty for the same crime, whether it's aimed at a gay person or a straight person? Because I think there's a contradiction between those two things. Yeah, um, I, I gave a long speech about hate crime last year, which uh, in which I tried to examine the dilemma, which uh, I think many of us feel about the, on the one hand, a concern uh, about the intrusion, potential intrusion uh, of the state uh, into uh, uh, free speech and free expression. Uh, and on the, the other hand, the particular need which I think exists in relation to uh, some minorities who can fall victim to uh, hateful expressions of uh, violent intent and so on. And I think that, that, that what makes hate crime special uh, is that um, it can uh, incite fear uh, not just in, on, on the part of the individual and the victim, but actually in the whole community. I mean, that is, I think, the definition of what makes heart, hate, hate crime uh, special, the way it, it, it can make uh, a whole community feel uh, vi victimized. Uh, I think we need to constrain the operation of uh, hate crime in this sphere carefully to, so as to ensure uh, that, uh, for instance, in relation to an offense of inciting hatred against gay people, we don't uh, outlaw temperate comment, uh, even if it's comment that we don't like, uh, that shouldn't form full part of, if you like, the criminal uh, uh, sphere. So uh, in, in saying that I, I don't want uh, gay people to have special treatment, what I mean by that is I want gay people to uh, be able to be in their communities and feel as safe as anybody else. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, if you uh, have a system which can allow expressions of kind of violent intent to run unchecked uh, against those people, I don't think they are being treated uh, in, in the same way. Uh, so I do think there is a place for carefully drawn uh, but um, nevertheless effective uh, hate, hate crime legislation to send particular signals uh, that... Uh, we should we, we we should we should never victimize people because of who they are Andrew my view is that this is a repellent attack upon individual liberty and freedom of thought and I have consistently held this and been targeted with a lot of hatred by the gay community <laughs> for saying so um, and this is an occasion to say that Maggie did not give an attack on or a critique of gay conservatism she created a straw man of gay leftism which many of us have fought we don't believe in coercing people's thoughts. Many people in this room, and some of them are liberals too, have strongly resisted all those tendencies within the gay movement. We do not, we strongly, firmly, passionately believe in religious liberty. However, if a religious grouping wants to take government money, my taxpayers' money and other people's money, if they want to do that, 
um, and then actively discriminate against people, civil people, in employment, then it seems to me uh, they have a choice to make. Take the money from the government or remain independent and free. Let me also make one other point about the people feeling scared because their religious convictions are being violated. The Southern Baptist Convention was founded, founded to defend slavery on grounds of religious conviction. When interracial marriage was proposed, getting rid of it in this country, vast numbers of Christians believed it was a violation of their religious faith that they should have to live among or tolerate this obvious abomination which they regarded as a religious truth. These are facts. What is the difference? Yes, they were terrified. They were so terrified they lynched black men. Their fear is not an argument. And basing an argument about civil politics on religious fear is nothing to do with conservatism whatsoever. It has to do with fundamentalist intolerance. Well, I'm not going to be baited in by Andrew into pretending that I made an argument about gay marriage when I didn't. Uh, and I'm not going to, I, I would just point out what, what Andrew describes as a straw man is the reality of where the law is going, okay? It's the reality that you cannot run a, Christ, a Catholic Charities cannot run adoption services in the District of Columbia or Massachusetts. Now, I'm not if entirely sure. No, no, money. actually, in Massachusetts, you're wrong. It's a felony to run an in adoption Washington, agency. Washington, D.C. In Massachusetts, it's a felony to run an adoption agency without a license. They will not give you a license unless you agree to place children in a non-discriminatory discriminatory way with gay couples. But in D.C., there where you're like, campaigning, is, is that there, true? There, well, uh, the details of D.C. I will find out shortly for you, but the, whether or not they are... You don't know them? No, I don't know them right uh, now. But you sorry. just actually pronounced on them? Yes, I did pronounce the truth that the Catholic Church... You don't Catholic know the truth. Church, you just said that. Can I speak a minute? You know, this is... Uh, because talk Only about straw... Coherent. Talk about okay. straw... Okay, now you're insulting, and I'm trying really hard to make a contribution in an alien... Art. Now, Andrew clearly thinks I have nothing to say worthy of value. All I'm going to say is it doesn't matter whether Andrew Sullivan thinks that there shouldn't be hate crimes and there shouldn't be, uh, uh, there should be better religious liberty protections. The point I'm making is that equality and gay rights as a liberty right is a different proposition from using the government to enforce a new ideal of gay equality, which if Andrew didn't support, I clearly hear Nick, Nick Herbert support. So, yes, I do believe there's a place for gay people in the conservative movement. I am not attempting to read them out. The question is whether Andrew can see a place for the 40 to 60 percent of Americans who do see a, 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 a big looming conflict, particularly on the marriage issue, even as, in fact, they want to live in an America where gay people are not afraid. Well, let me make a simple counterargument, about, and it's a Catholic one which is that divorce in the Catholic Church is clearly barred. I'm going to come uh, back. I'm going to tell you, Andrew, I will come back to Cato or any place and debate gay marriage with you, no, no, which no. we haven't done in five years. But I have, you haven't heard my argument about marriage. Well, That's not what I'm talking about right now. I just want to make the point, if I may, that, um, that civil divorce is the law of the land in, almost ev in every state of this country. There's even no fault divorce. The Catholic Church is not demanding, and that itself is a violation of the Catholic Church's understanding of marriage. The Catholic Church is not denying, is not shutting down its, uh, uh, its organizations because divorced people or remarried people might be employed. There is a double standard here. If the Catholic Church were consistent on this, if it treated divorced people the way it treats gay people, who are, I might add, in the question of marriage in exactly the same situation, divorced and remarried, then I think it would not be subject to the suspicion of animus. But I think the suspicion of animus is perfectly well justified when, when uh, there's such a glaring inconsistency. You know, actually, I know the bishops are very concerned in that point, and they're taking steps to bring the, the, the positions in line. So perhaps that will be a cleansing effect of this law on Catholic institutions. But none of, the, none of that changes the reality that I will guarantee you, if you just walk into America and say you think marriage is a husband and wife, you're going to be suspected of animus. 
And there's going to be a set of people, probably not, not Andrew, who will try to hurt you if they can in, in a variety of ways. And we gay conservatives will fight them every inch of the way, and we're well, happy to that, join you with on that. Okay. In some yeah. ways. I certainly don't want to, to, to comment on, 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 on the laws which have been, been framed at the state or, or federal level in, in, in this country. Um, but I can just tell you what um, the House of Commons uh, decided in the UK uh, about adoption, which is I exactly consistent with what I think was be being discussed, which is, which is that uh, in, in relation to uh, adoption, uh, where organizations are in receipt of uh, public money, in including faith-based organizations, then they have uh, to be non-discriminatory. Uh, but uh, where they are not in receipt of uh, public money, then they can continue uh, to pursue their policy in relation to a a adoption according to their conscience. And I think we have to be very careful about interfering uh, in the sphere of conscience or, or discretion on the part of religious organizations. We can't have an absolute bar uh, uh, on it because of situations in which the uh, nominal exercise of some kind of religious re b belief could do, sometimes intended to do, uh, real harm. But we need to be immensely cautious about it. And in another uh, chamber of our parliament, I, I, I you know, cite the House of Lords, an unelected chamber with some caution uh, in the United States of America. Uh, but nevertheless, that the, ha the House of Lords recently rejected an attempt uh, by, by the British government to uh, demand in the current Equality Bill, which is being discussed uh, before Parliament, that religious uh, uh, organisations uh, should employ people, um, including people who, uh, of a, a sexual orientation, who, which their conscience would uh, demand that, that they, they could not, would not be compatible with, with their role in that religious organization. Uh, it, the kind of uh, thing that, that Maggie was expressing an objection to. And I think that that rejection by the House of Lords of that proposal was absolutely right because it was an unwarranted inter interference in the exercise of conscience and discretion by that religious organization which did uh, not do harm. Uh, I just want to say that briefly, when the government gets big enough and large enough, being excluded from government benefits d does actually, I think, raise questions, liberty questions for people who are concerned with liberty and pluralism. How you resolve that depends on how strongly you believe that these organizations are evil bigots and discriminators for their views and how much you can say, even if you don't agree with them, you can see that people of goodwill might have that point of view and therefore we don't want to exclude them or in 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 ways from the public square it's not which a, it's is a statement a, that if you black or white, you if a private institution does not want suck at the government's teat it's somehow being victimized i don't know how that is a conservative or libertarian idea at all okay next question behind the camera there it's a uh, James Kirchick with the New Republic. I should say at the outset that I, I was one of the people who asked David uh, why Andrew was here, merely because, Andrew, you yourself have said that you're no longer a part of the conservative movement. Um, so I think the more salient fact is that in the last presidential election, 28% of gay identified voters voted for the McCain Palin ticket. The actual number of gay people who voted for the McCain Balin ticket was probably significantly higher because I'm assuming a lot of gay people aren't telling pollsters in exit polls that they're gay. So we're talking maybe 35 to 40 percent as a, as a guesstimate of gay people are voting for the Republican Party. So I don't think you speak for gay conservatives on this issue um, of where the Republican Party is. And I think that's the more salient fact, the fact that a third of gay voters are voting GOP. I think that answers the question posed to us today. And in terms of the future, um, it's just a matter of whether or not those gay conservatives are going to fight for their place in the movement. Um, so I'm just curious as to the thoughts of the, of the people on the panel to that fact. Well, um, I would say that I've been very clear and tried written a book, which I urge if people really think I want to understand what I mean by conservatism. I've written a book called The Conservative Soul. Um, I've studied Oakshot, I've studied Hayek, I have studied Strauss. Um, I think I know a little bit more about it than Jamie Kirchick, uh, to be honest. Uh, and I do not believe that the conservative movement as it now exists in America has a place for a conservative like me. But I do refuse to give up 
the term conservative because it's something that I believe in. I, I, for example, 73% of Republicans today in a latest poll said they would like to ban openly gay people from teaching in public high schools. In 1978, Ronald Reagan famously opposed the Briggs Initiative in California, which was to do such a thing. I don't think that I am no longer a conservative because I support Ronald Reagan's position and not the bigots that now control the Republican Party. Andrew, I think that you're right that this isn't a debate about whether Andrew Sullivan is a conservative, and I'm happy to just say that if Andrew thinks he's a conservative, he has a number of conservative viewpoints, he's, he's a conservative. The question is, is uh, whether, given the complex of values that gay people have, does it make sense to be, I mean, how, what is the, I mean, I guess one of the questions is, does it really make sense to join the Democrats and the Obama? I don't think this is a new question for, I mean, I actually started thinking about this in the early 90s. I did an early newspaper column, because I, I lived in Park Slope, Brooklyn, and I ran into a gay guy who runs a small business, and he was saying he's going to vote for Rudy Giuliani, who we now think is one of the more pro-gay Republicans. But believe me, back then in New York, that wasn't the perception. And I started thinking about that. Being gay is an important part of, of who gay people are, but it's not the only part, right? I mean, he's also a small business owner. You know, crime and taxes, lots of things affect him. And just as being, as you say, being gay doesn't mean that you're going to vote in a political collective based on your gay identity. Sometimes it will mean that. And sometimes it will mean in the bigger complex of a commitment to liberty. I would say, here's, we are living in an America where gay people are, feel more and more free, open, and empowered. This could go in two directions. A chunk of gay people are likely to therefore feel free to disconnect from gay politics as a specific politics. Another chunk are going to raise their expectations and things that were not really that salient. Well, for example, like the marriage issue. In 1990, nobody cared what you thought about gay marriage. Now it's become a symbol of gay aspirations. I don't know what the next thing is, but some people will raise their expectations and make these issues a symbol of whether gay people are respected in this country as well as a practical issue for their lives. Other people will feel that's less and less relevant, and they will decide whether they're conservatives and to vote for Republicans based on whether they think you know, containing jihadism is better served by President McCain or President Obama, or who's going to lower their taxes, or, uh, you know. And I must say, on my part, my worry about jihadism is one reason I supported President Obama after the disastrous uh, wars and mistakes that uh, President Bush made. I think that that was one of the critical reasons I supported President Obama, because President Bush's war on terror was such a catastrophe in so many ways. And as a human being and as a Catholic, I find the, the use of torture by the American government to be something so disgusting. Again, I was trying to not make it about whether Andrew is a conservative or well, not, no, but I'm, I'm just, just saying, saying that, yes, the gay people that, I'm will just make say, I'm just, different judgments based on these non-gay issues. Yeah. I'm agreeing with you, Maggie. Good. Totally agreeing with you. Okay, I'm going to take a question over here by the wall. Jason Kuznicki, Cato Institute. Uh, my question's for Maggie Gallagher. Uh, in 2003, uh, I entered into a same-sex marriage. Uh, I've been with my partner ever since. Uh, we've adopted a daughter. I hear you say that there's a place uh, for gay conservatives. I, I'm having trouble seeing it, however. What am I supposed to do? Uh, someone in my situation, do I, do I leave my husband? Do I enter ex-gay therapy? Do I try to return my daughter to the state somehow? Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm really not seeing this. I, I don't understand well, I, okay. how there is a livable place for gay people uh, who are conservatives to, to your way of thinking. I, I can sort of understand uh, being an Andrew Sullivan gay conservative, but I also see that that's contentious. Uh, what, what I want to know is, what I want to know is, how am I to live my life if I wanted to be a gay conservative and I agreed with you? I don't know. But you don't have to agree with me to be a gay conservative. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's, what I, that's what I'm saying. What, the question would be, can you participate in a political movement with, you know, the 80% of Republicans who think marriage is the union of husband and wife? Now, Not if the question is, how do I interact with you, I could answer that. If the question is how you interact with me, you'd have to answer that, right? Okay, that's, I mean, not, that's not fair, because, because of the following fact. I'm perfectly prepared and supported a President Bush, who disagreed with me on the question of same-sex marriage. 
That is not what the Republican Party is about. The Republican Party is about a constitutional amendment to strip us permanently of any rights in our relationship. And I support that constitutional, constitutional amendment. the Constitution of the United States. It is to single out a minority for permanent second-class status in the United States. It's the most radical attack upon a minority in this country since Jim Crow, and you supported it. To compare a, the idea that marriage means one man and one woman to Jim Crow is I, so, I mean, it's so, it's, I mean, I can't take morally seriously that wasn't somebody who can say that. the point of the amendment. The point of the amendment, I, as you I can't, well no, know, the point of the amendment, was to, that's was the, to that, stop gay people well, that, that is the way, what the point is. The, stop the, us the, forever. The point is that you hear that as an incredibly ugly and offensive attack. I think that it's both true and good for the country. And that for me, that is perfectly consistent with believing that gay people have rights, their citizens, their friends, their fellow neighbors. Can you How name, you put it, that together. Can you name a single gay person who agrees with you? Yes. Really? I told you, I have them, they work for Name me. them. Oh, well, no, I'm not going to name them because I'm not going to Why gonna not? You told, for earlier you said you don't want to out an openly gay person. <laughs> what an being absurd being anti-gay marriage, I'll let them do it. I'm not outing them as gay. I'm Absolutely outing them as being on my side. Thing. Even the most, which means it's not true. The, okay, now either, you're calling me a liar. Okay, no, you're I'm just calling saying, name me, the openly gay no, people you're calling me who a liar. supported a constitutional amendment. Well, okay, there are gay people who Maggie knows who support this amendment. Uh, openly gay people. Not very many. But I do know them. They come to me. Sometimes they come to me secretly. I got an email from a guy who told me at, right before Prop 8, this wasn't the federal amendment, but it is a... I don't know. Maybe he was lying. I don't know him. He emailed me and said he was at a, a dinner party with eight other gay guys, and they realized they were all going to vote for Prop 8. And, uh, you know, I... I don't. Maybe he just. Maybe some no, no, straight no, no, person no, no, is no, no. pretending that. To that me. was not I my question. Know. My question was the constitutional amendment. It's a state constitutional. I'm amendment. talking about the federal constitution. You know what I'm talking about. Don't avoid the subject. The federal constitutional amendment. I'm well known for avoiding difficult subjects, but Andrew. I just. I'm scared, and I don't say what I think. Well, answer me. Okay. Answer Nick, the question. You, you no, I, I certainly don't want to uh, interfere in. <laughs> Uh, in in this dispute, but um, all, all I wanted to say is is that um, coming out is a, a very difficult process, and the encouraging thing for us in the Conservative Party is that over the course of the last four years, uh, we found that hundreds and thousands, if not millions, of people have been coming out as Conservatives, and uh, at a, a, a at one uh, Pride march in Brighton, uh, we we. Uh, what, by popular acclaim, uh, the, 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 the gay float in that, in that pride uh, was considered by far the best because it consisted of, of a lot of uh, young conservative activists who were wearing the T-shirt, I came out as a conservative. <laughs> there are places where that's even harder, right? <laughs> I don't doubt there are some. Um, all right, I'm going to take one more question right here. Yes. I'm a law student at George Mason, and I noticed that this was a GLBT type of um, seminar, but I didn't hear anything about the T part, so I want to ask, is there a role for transgendered people in the conservative party? Well, you I, mean I, the conservative community. Yes. There is no conservative party well, in America. I absolutely believe so. Um, but I will tell you this, that the people who control the Republican Party uh, consider it self-mutilation. And when you read the hateful, disgusting literature by Maggie Gallagher's allies, people she works with on a daily basis about transgendered people, um, there is no place within the Republican Party for people who are transgendered, I'm afraid. It's going and, to be really and hard. You, and, and, and I think that is, a, that is a function of pure ignorance at best. Uh, and obviously bigotry. So no, you, there is no role for transgender people in the current Republican Party. I believe there absolutely should be. I think a transgender person who, for example, believes that we need to have a strong defense and balance our budget should be welcome, <laughs> welcome in the conservative movement, even though the Republican Party doesn't believe in a balanced budget and, is <laughs> and has no plans or proposals to cut spending in any way whatsoever and is fiscally a fraudulent organization. But um, 
if and when it does come to its senses, I hope transgender people will be fully part of that movement. I, I will extend my invitation from open, openly gay people who want to work for NAM's mission to transgendered people too. Nick, I'll give you the last word here. Uh, well, the answer to the, the question is, uh, I think, yeah, yes, uh, there is, and that the same uh, principles should apply. Uh, I just wanted to say that I, I, I kind of look forward to the, uh, the, the day when we're not having this kind of debate, but instead of having uh, the kind of debate that people I think, wanted to force on uh, about uh, wider political values and political policies. When I was uh, first elected uh, nearly five years ago, I for a photograph with 50 newly elected Conservative members of Parliament at the House of Commons. And each, each uh, person uh, in the photograph of us all together uh, in the Times newspaper had a small caption underneath which described who they were. So uh, with my colleagues it said things like, you know, uh, businessman or, 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 or teacher, um, think tank person believes in small government. There was some small phrase of description. And uh, the description uh, under my photograph uh, just said, gay Eurosceptic. <laughs> <laughs> and, and um, you know, I, I, I was really quite cross about that. And, <laughs> I, I, and for a couple of years uh, in the House of Commons, um, I certainly wouldn't have uh, decided to make a speech uh, like the one I've just made because I felt very strongly uh, that these issues should be beyond debate, that uh, I was elected because I was a conservative and had conservative values and had views and points of view that I wanted to have a, a validity uh, in, in what I said that had nothing to do with my sexual orientation. I simply regarded it as irrelevant, and I think most of my electors did. But I came to see that it was important to take a stance on these issues for the signals that we send out to others. Uh, and it was the many letters and emails and conversations that I had with people uh, who uh, simply thanked me for the fact that I had, I had been elected and, and was willing to be uh, open about who I was, who, that persuaded me uh, that what we say about ourselves uh, as political parties, what we say about ourselves as politicians and, and our values, the language that we use, and, and the manner in which we can appear to push people away casually uh, is incredibly important in our ability as politicians and parties to communicate with people more widely. And, 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 and that is what I was trying to say uh, about these issues, not just that in principle it must be right that we treat people on the basis of uh, uh, an equal chance and, and don't discriminate, but also that as politicians, we need, I think, to mount an appeal which is uh, generous and optimistic and inclusive, and that we should never be, uh, as, as politicians, uh, people who simply, uh, because of what, what others may feel about us or about our views, is, are, are pushing uh, pe people away. And that's why I felt it was important to stand up and take a stance. All right. Thank you all for coming. I want to thank Andrew Sullivan and Maggie Gallagher for a lively discussion. And I want to thank Nick Herbert for favoring us with this uh, important and, and in some ways path-breaking speech and wish him safe travels getting back to London for an impending election. Thank you. <laughs>